distinguished Adam Cienczyk, I hope I pronounced it correctly, students and alumni of the Academy of Fine Arts and the University of Arts, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Sastamoinen Foundation, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the opening of the third keynote lecture in the Sastamoinen keynote lecture series. At the same time, I want to thank also the preceding lecturers, curator Okvi Envesor and the artist duo Elmgren Raxet. Founded by the Kartunen family in 1968, the Sastamoinen Foundation will celebrate this year its 15th anniversary. Throughout these years, we have fulfilled the mission of supporting Finnish science and art and collecting visual arts. Today, it has become one of the leading foundations to support art and art education in Finland. The lesser known part of our vocation are our partnerships in the fields of medical science and economic studies with two major universities. Research on epilepsy and seizures or bioeconomic legislation or Fulbright grants are just a small example of the foundation's areas of the focus today. We believe in long-term commitments, long-term relationship and partnership fooled with curiosity and excitement for the future. This year's keynote lecture with Adam Tinczyk ends our first three-year partnering with your academy. It doesn't mean that we will disappear. No, we have already committed for another three years. Documenta, number 14 in the row, has just finished and still in our fresh memory. Adam, I'm pleased that you came to the northern part of Europe to share your ideas. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. I would like to thank the Academy of Fine Arts and Jan Kaila in specific. You and your team have done a great job. Have a nice lecture. Thank you, Maria. And uh, can you hear me well? Is this like the, the right Odic level? All right. So, um, first of all, it's lovely there's so many of you. And also in uh, spite of the weather. So, uh, thank you, audience, for being here. And now, um, I'm Jan Kaila, the Dean of the Academy of Fine Arts. and. Um, I wanted to sort of break tradition in the sense where I have a paper here and the paper is uh, Adam's biography. But instead of just reading through the biography, I wanted to break the tradition and ask you a few questions about your biography, if okay, right? So, um, uh, and, 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 and you can either just say like, no, no, I don't want to comment this at all. Or well, then you can comment it. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it says, and I'm, I'm using Wikipedia now, which is sort of a problematic source. But on the other hand, I found that your Wikipedia description is quite well done when I compare it to many other sources that were around concerning your past. Right? So um, it says you studied art history at uh, Warsaw University. Is this something you want to comment? True. And that's all? Um, yeah, um, I studied art history at the University of Warsaw and it took me uh, about, I think, 11 years to finish with a May. Um, I had major breaks or interruptions on the way. And um, <coughs> the university, I mean, the faculty of art history was pretty conservative at that time, so I was interested in contemporary art. I came from Łódź, uh, Lodz, which is the city that has one of the first two or three museums of um, modern art established in, in Europe. Um, so the museum in Łódź was established by the initiative of a group of artists and poets um, around 1930, who obtained uh, donations from 
let's say, artists who were part of international avant-garde movement in different countries. They gathered around 150 works and opened the first exhibition of modern art in the city hall um, in Łódź. And this collection survived the war and then was significantly expanded. And so I was growing up in an environment that was kind of saturated with uh, modern art, but there was no art history faculty in the city of Łódź, so I went to study art history in Warsaw, but it was kind of um, difficult because they would not really teach on uh, contemporary art and not really on modern art, so it was a fairly conventional course, of, you know, from like ancient art to more or less 1945 or so but not really. And um, yeah, so then I got involved in, in curating through acquaintance with um, Galeria Foxal, which was a, uh, which is still a space in Warsaw, very small, uh, like eight by eight meters, um, founded in 1966, that showed um, mostly conceptual artists, Polish and international, through um, 30 years during the communist era and this gallery continued after 1989 the political change and I started to work there as an assistant kind of so um, that was my kind of introduction to working with artists more directly and uh, to exhibition making in a very practical manner Okay, so... Oh, right. Okay. Uh, and um, then um, we're going into your sort of life. And um, then you uh, entered the education in Amsterdam called the Appel. And, th and that's a very famous uh, curatorial program. Uh, one of the first ones in Europe. And when you look at the, the, the map nowadays, there's loads of curatorial programs, but mm -hmm. at that time there were not too many. Could you tell a little bit about this period? What yeah, I'm for pretty you? skeptical about formalized education of that kind, but the course in Amsterdam was, I think, w one of the first two or three in Europe. There was something in Grenoble and something in London at the Royal College at that time, and um, the course in Amsterdam was like one year more or less course which ended up in an exhibition that we made together with co-students, which were only, I think, five. And I think um, Hank Slager was one of the tutors. You showed me the book that he co-edited yesterday. I think we, the students, were a reason for a m major headache of our tutors because we basically um, straight away refused to be educated and we wanted to make an exhibition that was kind of a little bit of a slap, of a slap in the face of the institution and ended up in kind of pretty thorough physical and organizational demolition of the, the Apple Contemporary Art Center in Amsterdam through several interventions by different artists. And then I came back to Poland after that and, and started to work in kind of more proper institutional context. And in 1997, being fed up with institutions as they were, I co-founded together with two friends at the Foxhall Gallery Foundation because we wanted to have a own institution that would be more agile and serve as a tool to fulfill our um, dreams, if you like. All right, uh, I'll continue. I mean, uh, according to, uh, again, excuse me for this, but Wikipedia, you are director of Kunsthalle Basel uh, since 2003, and it's a very powerful institution. Would you sort of comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I got this, this job as a director of Kunsthalle Basel in 2003, and I gave it up in 2014, after I was appointed um, <coughs> to the position of direct, uh, artistic director of Documenta 14. So for about 10 years, I was constantly making exhibitions there. So it was a machine 
produced um, eight exhibitions per year, sometimes more. So there was like around 100 shows, most of them with some publications and so forth. And most of these shows were kind of more like individual shows, specially commissioned projects with all kinds of artists. I mean, that, that would be a, a very long talk. Right. And uh, to come to the end of this part, then in 2014 you were nominated as the uh, curator of Documenta 14. And now I give the floor to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, first, I'm, I'm going to to to, to present a kind of more more formal introduction to the comment that was written at a certain stage uh, of the process. So this is not not an exhibition. I think it's important for me to say that exhibition is a kind of experience and it's a it's a genre in itself in its own right in a way that cannot be reduced to to a text because it's a phenomenon that is bound to a specific time and specific place it has a duration and it has locations and um, these two um, fundamental premises the unity of time and location were to be um, questioned quite significantly in the way we organized Documenta 14, um, which I will talk about in the second part, um, where I'm going to show you around our website and tell you a little bit about it, why it was important to do it and why it was important to, to build this website in, in this particular way. Um, I will begin with a motto, which is borrowed from a historian, Timothy Garthon Ash, who is a British historian writing about European matters, East Europe and Germany. And in 2013, as I was getting ready to write a proposal for Documenta 14, being one of the candidates invited to, to, to present such proposal, I came across an article in the New York Review of Books which was titled The New German Question. And Timothy Garton Ash wrote the following short paragraph about Germany. The land is civilized, free, prosperous, low abiding, moderate, and cautious. Its many virtues may be summarized as the banality of the good. Asked by the tabloid newspaper Bild Zeitung on November 30th, 2004, what feelings Germany awakens in her, Angela Merkel famously replied, quote, I think of well-sealed, nice windows. No other country can make such well-sealed and nice windows. In German, dichte und schöne Fenster. So that was a motto. And now we go to the main part and then we close with, with some remarks about this motto and statement of Angela Merkel, who is now running for her third term as a chancellor. Um, since Documenta 14 started off through small and almost private gatherings at the Café Avicinia in Athens in December 2013 and March 2014, and since the activities of Documenta 14 in Athens and Kassel became gradually visible in 2015 and entered a fully embodied public phase in 2016, the workers of Documenta 14 have been confronted with all kinds of artistic matters, faced urgent practical issues and witnessed political upheavals, social developments, wars, and humanitarian catastrophes of the period between 2013 and 2017. But first and foremost, we began to slowly recognize the paradoxical logic of the enterprise called Documenta, which is an elusive and haunting presence, a phantom of sorts that is never to be located. And in this way, it offers a good starting point for reflection about contemporary condition of neoliberal capitalism 
that placeless and faceless formation that came to define the existence of the people living on this planet today, and about the role cultural production is typically bound to play in the seemingly seamlessly constructed system of production and consumption, aesthetic perusal and investment, and our functions in it, the functions defined at the outset as those of invited artists, the team organizing the exhibition and the expected spectators, all three categories sustaining and embodying the apparatus in question. As we know, Documenta was initiated and thoughtfully given its name by a multi-talented castle artist, designer and exhibition maker Arnold Bode in 1955. And since then, it went through a series of modifications on both curatorial and organizational level, which can be explained against the backdrop of larger global developments in which Europe remained central reference in Documenta. Even though the Eurocentric thinking got to be repeatedly questioned since Documenta 10, organized by Catherine David in 1997. The ideological fruit of Marshall Plan and German economic recovery, paralleling moral reconstruction of German society after the Nazi rule came to an end, Documenta has since become one of the strongest brands and most expected events of contemporary art world, assuming the role of its conscience with each edition of Documenta, mirroring, witnessing and fiercely commenting its time. In its function of a mirror, witness and commentator, Documenta remained unchanged, despite many decisive historical turns that happened on the way. The end of Cold War, Documenta's proper living environment through its first eight editions, the, the fall of Berlin Wall, reunification of Germany, which equaled loss of Kassel's position on the eastern flank of the West, and subsequent remaking of Europe that had consequences for the world order and allowed art market to expand alongside other markets. The first Gulf War and the Iraqi War, the stiffening embrace of neoliberal economy that came to exert its power on global scale, the trauma of 9-11 and the vertiginous fall the democracies have been experiencing, accompanied by economic crisis on unprecedented scale embodied in the crisis that hit Greece in 2008 and keeps the country in its cold grip, as if by common tacit agreement within the European family of nations until today. And finally, the Arab Spring, the war in Syria, the annexation of Crimea by Russia, with the ensuing war in eastern Ukraine and the advances of authoritarian rule in Turkey. To that, we could also add the rise of the right-wing um, rule in several European countries, Eastern and Western Europe. And all of that happening <coughs> in the context of apparent collapse of patriarchal, heteronormative, colonial and neo-colonial order of discourse, which in our view is an inescapable framework that must be addressed, always anew, in order to understand the current state of things in the world. The result of recent presidential elections in the US leaves little hope to those believing the course of empire should change any soon. The decision to conceive Documenta 14 as a theater and its double in Athens and Kassel was a consequence of felt necessity to act in real time and real world. This world cannot be any longer explained, commented and narrated only from Kassel as a vantage point singularly located in northern and western Europe. All four previous editions of Documenta gesticulated powerfully to this state of things. After Catherine David's 100 days, 100 guests, and many of those were from far away, Oqui Envisor's platforms brought Documenta 11 far away from the map we were accustomed to use. Roger Burgel and Ruth Noack in their Documenta 12 demonstrated the wandering of forms that transgress territories and traverse history. Caroline Christoph Bakarjiev located satellite acts and exhibitions elsewhere, and notably in war-torn Kabul. 
art is a physical as much as it is a mental experience. It's not an abstract demonstration of conditions that can be deployed in any context. The place and the time matter, contrary to illusions of global accessibility and undistinguishable sameness of being, we are induced to believe in by advanced marketing strategies of global capital and optimistic narrations of failing mainstream politics. At the same time, we are experiencing painfully limited mobility. We are facing drastic restrictions of individual freedoms, and we came to live in the world that has been changing into a place of fear, not hope, where it has become progressively more difficult to risk any prediction of a future, not to mention explaining it to the next generation. These facts of existence do not seem in the least to bother those in power. The contradance of politicians who have no vision to offer and no means to implement it upsets our beliefs in democracy based on the idea of elected political representation of the people. This democracy recently brought to power an array of reactionary, conservative or dictatorial governments around the world and there is no end to it in sight. This is a dangerous moment in which democracy must be thought anew, reinvented, instead of just being disposed of, which can easily happen when the authoritarian thinking prevails over participatory model. Too easily, an answer to deficiencies of democracy is offered in the form of autocratic rule, veiled in democratic procedures, first securing control over military and surveillance apparatuses, then taking on administration, education, judiciary, media, cultural production, and so on. In Europe, we have seen it happening in Russia, Hungary, and Poland. We saw it in Turkey. We may soon see the great European nations turning in this direction. At the time of writing of this text, we see dangerous signs of similar development in the US with appointment of hawkish officials to nation's key security posts. Other countries may likely follow the, the course. The path chosen by those who want to make America great again, as it is happening recently also in places like Moldova and Bulgaria, where anti-democratic, anti-European political forces took the lead. The voters in France faced this choice and Germany is facing it now. It is the crisis of democracy and old binaries constituting the distribution of political power that motivates us to speak from within the artistic field today hoping that rather than being a mere reproduction of existing social relationships, art can produce and inhabit space, enable discourses beyond what is known to all, and act to challenge the predictable, gloomy course of events that keep us sleepless. The move of Documenta to Athens in order to learn from this city and not to give its people lessons is meant to open the space of possibility. Old world is based on concepts of belonging, identity, and rootedness. Our world will be the one of radical subjectivities. The search for lost origins, disentangling of confused selves, coming to terms with uprooted identities, keep us busy and leave no time and space for life, suspending us in the state of misery from which we ever try to escape as the notions of home, safety, and life itself are being constantly imperiled and daily violated by neo-colonial warmongering, economic and scientific exploits, and egoism in the garb of entrepreneurial spirit. It seems an accusation, yet it, it, it cannot find its exact address The collective and historical we of the Western civilization, the unstoppable conquest of territory, and insatiable hunger for dissemination of our pretty narrow-minded and historically limited ways of being, sometimes misleadingly called ideals, as in the philosophy of German idealism, which was closely linked to European Enlightenment politics, French Revolution and German early Romanticism around the Athenaeum Journal, which became, according to Jean-Luc Nancy and Philippe Lacoulabat, the first ever avant-garde movement in Europe at the end of 18th century. So these conquests and this hunger for dissemination of our um, historically limited ways of being led us to the point that we should seriously think about decreasing 
rather than increasing. There is nowhere to go. The world has become known and ends here. Artists may show a way beyond and below the known. They teach us, writers, filmmakers, sculptors, painters, musicians, actors, and all those once excluded from entering the Republic, that we must first learn to become strangers to ourselves, undergo a decreation instead of sustaining overproduction, shake the foundations of our positive and passive understanding of the world, abandon the cities, inhabit the cities again, and Castle and Athens can be the case in point here. Care about how we work and what we do with fruits of our labor. These questions were formulated within the field of arts since the 19th century realism and the 20th century radical avant-garde and post-war neo-avant-garde, targeting the reactionary politics that supports the build-up of capitalism and colonialism through all its different turns, which enhances creation of art only as long as it remains decoration or representation of power, and remained critical through all its phases until today, when the consolidation has been accomplished and the generalized necropolitics per Achille Mbembe of modern war machines and global neo-colonial enterprise supplanted the biopolitical power once embodied by founding repressive institution of European modernity from mental asylum through school, prison and in the end concentration camp. We live in societies where control became the ultimate goal and potential or actual state violence a tool to constantly produce and reproduce fear experienced by society's subjects as necessary component that permeates our being in the world. Control has become an indispensable part of us. We carry it within, internalized, rather than experience it as external incursion. In spring 2016, we proposed the first of many formats that sought an opening towards another way of making and thinking. Continuum, a term borrowed from a Greek composer, Yanni Christou, describes an open form of common action, a score for activities that may occur over an undefined period of time, engaging different actors and their contributions without a prescribed scenario. The continuum became a vessel that allowed us to receive and work with artists invited to Documenta 14 in a semi-public condition of the Prevalaki Hall um, in the area of Athens School of Fine Arts at the Polytechnic of Athens in the historical city center. This place was a scene of the anti-junta students uprising in 1973, which was an important reference for us for locating this early phase of, of preparations for Documenta, or maybe it was already a Documenta right there in 2016. In autumn 2016, 34 exercises of freedom instituted Documenta 14's Parliament of Bodies through a 10-day celebration involving artists, activists and scholars in nightly sessions with growing public participation. In the building that was converted into a municipal art gallery after it had served as detention and torture center of the former headquarters of EAT ESA, the Greek secret police during the time of military junta between 1967 and 1974. <coughs> While practicing these exercising exercises, discussing, performing, dancing, being together, we felt that we are almost trespassing a forbidden zone, not because of the burden of the recent historical past we tried to address and cope with as good as we could, being foreigners, but because of the ecstatic and joyful energy unleashed in the Parliament of Bodies, despite occasional slumps of mood and bouts of doubt. The Parliament of Boris took then shape of several societies dedicated to practice and analysis of themes developed by their participants rather than offered ready-made for an audience. The names of these societies, among them the Apatrid Society, the Society of the Stateless, 
and Society for the End of Necropolitics were meant as call for action that should result from bringing people together and formulating concrete strategies to counter the divisive, damaging effects of neoliberal mindset and its fascist shadow. The relationship with what is usually called audience that we conventionally tend to think the visitors not as participants in a common task, but as voters, the politicians try to win while running in elections, is one of the key moments in the process of making of Documenta 14. The dispositive, the apparatus given to us, that of Documenta as such, made of cumulative experience of all past 13 editions, reserves a limited place for audience. The audience is then understood as quantifiable mass of people calculated through numbers of expected ticket sales. This audience should be then received in many ways, starting with infrastructure such as toilets and food stands, ticket points, signage, and the entire city in its multiple functions considered as a receiving site. The audience is then guided through exhibition and illuminated as to its nature and meaning through wall texts and explanations of guides. And this is where education is supposed to play a role. In Documenta 14, we set out with the concept of an education. An education that attempts to stay aware of and read of its habits and form a chorus of hosts singing together with visitors. Even if actual singing did not take place, our hope was no top-down teaching would be involved, no matter how often we were reminded that many people, especially children and elderly, apparently expect to be told how to understand things. We, on the contrary, were interested in how they understand things. And since they came as they were, they had to bring a lot of knowledge with them. Instead of infantilizing the audience, Documenta 14 wanted to empower the visitors as the true owners of Documenta, each holding a share in a common undertaking, together with its makers, the organizers, alongside the artists and other participants. Only in this way the Documenta could strive to become a participatory experience. Strive, not become instantly. And an exercise in present is democracy rather than one based on the representative capacity of politically legitimate elected officials, the curators and artists they invited alone. Even before the continuum parliament of bodies and an education be began to gradually fall in place, South as a State of Mind, the magazine of Documenta 14, conceived as a temporary station of the eponymous magazine founded in Athens by Marina Fokidis, unfolded in three subsequent issues. The fourth and final one um, uh, came out uh, actually after the exhibition closed in Kassel in uh, October uh, last year. Embracing literary genres, archival documents, commissioned essays, uh, with their corresponding imagery and special contributions by artists, poets, composers and others, the magazine took its course as part of the process of Documenta 14, rather than simply followed it. At the same time, each issue of South proposed to address a pair of complementary or only tangentially corresponding terms that came to inform the field of Documenta 14 and be informed by impulses coming from this very field. Those pairs of terms were displacement and dispossession, silence and masks, language and hunger, and the last one was violence and offering. These free and associative evocative terms allowed us to reach into vast resources of contemporary decolonial critique, indigenous knowledge, minor traditions within and outside the mainframe of modernism, post-queer politics and a plethora of other subjects that screamed for attention. These are but few instances from a larger manual, the one we have been discussing and designing in the team right from the start of the process, trying to invent tools that help to bend and dismantle the received terms of engagement with an exhibition, and ultimately challenge the exhibition itself, 
that documenta, nowhere to be found but appearing to exist even before one had a chance to ask what is the exhibition. Exhibitions seem to follow in most cases the unity of place, the venue, the city, time, duration of the show and or program of events and action. Convergence of thematic scope, media and means engaged. By moving an act of the show to Athens and keeping an act in Castle, introducing two partially overlapping timelines, Athens, April, July, and Castle, June, September, as well as by receiving all artists twice, first Athens, then Castle, with two diverse agendas and the possibility of ending up with an entirely different or the same work as part of two different parts of one exhibition in two cities, we introduced producers and initiated early on processes to unsettle the original stability and blur accountable, predictable workings of the enterprise of a documenta exhibition, of any exhibition. Exhibitions are thought to be stable and discrete forms. It is the uniqueness and singularity of their experience, the essentializing power the exhibition holds over its exhibits, its makers, artists and organizers, and its viewers that we thought to be constitutive for the prevailing spectacular mode of production and reception of large international exhibitions, of any exhibition. This stability seems hard to overcome, especially in large exhibitions such as Documenta, that are depending in myriad ways on their context of production. A complex but not entirely invisible network of political and commercial interests, more or less vested. Those exhibitions are also facing expectation of intelligibility, followed by demand of instant success and instant access. And this is where the disconcerting iterability, the difference and the repetition we wished to offer came into play. First Athens, then Castle. Try and try again. Who owns Documenta? The stakeholders in Documenta GGMBH, which is a Documenta non-profit limited liability company, that's the institution or organization enterprise that is behind each edition of Documenta. So the stakeholders in this enterprise are the city of Kassel and the land of Hesse. Um, while the Kulturstiftung des Bundes, the German Federal Cultural Foundation, established in 2002 by the German federal government, represented by the Federal Government Commissioner for Culture and the Media, is the major state supporter of Documenta and holds a position in its supervisory board of Documenta GGMBH. The International Search Committee, a group of contemporary art professionals, selects artistic director and proposes the candidate to supervisory board to the stakeholders, Castle and Hess. But beyond this or, uh, legal organizational frame and beyond the obvious claims of Castle to be the Documenta city, a title to the city's pride and main selling point in the city's marketing, Documenta does not exist, or rather it only exists as a potentiality to be realized and made present every five years in the exhibition and developments that lead to it. I would argue that rather than only being a tool of the national cultural policy in Germany, and an event expected to generate a significant economic impact in Kassel and the region, Documenta must be considered as an autonomous, commonly owned and inclusive artistic and self-organized undertaking carried out by a multitude composed of visitors experiencing and debating the exhibition and its preceding stages, by artists contributing their time and work and organizers, the team working to deliver a transformative experience in real time. Seen in this perspective, Documenta is owned collectively and by no one in particular. An unlimited number of shares, open to anyone willing to participate anywhere and anytime. Still, this participation hindered by above-mentioned restrictions of mobility that are experienced around the globe and by the cultural and economic factors that limit the access to the exhibition to a predominantly privileged 
Western European American audience must be yet fully realized. Therefore, in Documenta 14, we propose to consider each visitor and each participant an owner of one of unlimited number of unissued shares of the exhibition. Only by re realizing individually with, within the coming community of Documenta 14 what it means to co-own a common undertaking, we can move towards realizing radical subjectivity in full. This act of becoming an owner rather than consumer or producer of Documenta 14 and of our entire lives can be performed in many different ways in Athens and Kassel and elsewhere through symbolic and practical gestures, interventions, celebrations and rituals. As long as we do not institute, realize and use the possibility of claiming our share in the commons through an act of radical subjectivization, we will not be able to move away from apparatuses of sovereign power that we were born into and that continue to shape and destroy our lives. From precarious la labor conditions and debilitating political schemes that keep us isolated from each other and minding only our own businesses. Documenta 14 was conceived as a project of urgent rethinking and transformation of everyday experience and thinking the role of artistic production, both material and immaterial, beyond its application as currency of art market and part of culture industry in the times marked by convulsions of financial capitalism. It is up to all of us to decide what we do with the means we have at our disposal and cancel the debt now. Otherwise, we will be left contemplating the world through windows, which are in the meantime neither well sealed nor nice, and they do not offer us any beautiful views anymore. Right. So, th this uh, as an introduction um, to kind of explain more or less the type of conversation um, we were involved in with uh, both the curators, curatorial assistants, editors and many others who uh, were working on Documenta and of course also artists and those uh, whom we uh, invited to, to participate in the project. And I thought to, to show you some um, parts of the website because I, I believe it's still a, um, a good way to uh, get at least a little bit into the project. I hope this computer is going to to work. Let's see. Yeah, miracle. All right. Um, I actually this is th this is just just a f first view, but actually it has this one part in it that is only going to be visible for a brief moment. It's this line, and <coughs> then it kind of blends with sort of content that seems to be kind of strewn on a wor work desk and then disappears. So this line is a little bit like a light lightning, but also it is a little bit like a, like a part of a um, diagram explaining the sort of crisis condition or maybe fall of a market or, or something like that. But actually this line is, is, a, is a kind of um, one of the possible Google Map uh, routes connecting um, the city of Athens with the city of Kassel and it was used as such for a project by an artist called Ross Birel, um, the project called Transit of Hermes, which um, <coughs> started um, in Athens and it's a basically, it was a horse Right, it was a long distance horse ride from Athens to Kassel uh, that was kind of going on through 
first on the exhibition, in duration of the exhibition in Athens, and then it was still going on when the sh show opened in Kassel, and then it ended up with um, the riders arriving and being received by the city's representatives and others in front of the um, Parthenon of um, Forbidden Books, um, the work of Argentinian artists of uh, artist Marta Minuhin, which work came to kind of um, dominate the media picture of Documenta, and I'd like to perhaps say a little bit about this work, why we decided to put the Parthenon of Books right in the middle of Friedrichsplatz in Kassel in front of the Museum Friedericianum. So the reasons were several. Um, we wanted to, uh, to bring a kind of uh, um, sort of simplified r replica of the actual Parthenon in Athens as a kind of ultimate uh, cliche image and to make it material um, in, in the middle of that part of the exhibition in Kassel, Germany. We also wanted to create a place which would be very likely to be um, photographed or filmed a uh, million times, and it in indeed it was. It kind of solved the uh, for the media <coughs> which image to choose, because it was very, very appealing, and it was kind of seemingly non-controversial, and it was very familiar. So um, everybody knows Parthenon, and you know people tend to believe that Parthenon stands for, for instance, d democracy, which is a kind of interesting thought um, that took quite a long time to to be formed, and so you know the pillars of this Parthenon are to be understood as somehow pillars of uh, democracy or maybe of Western civilization, and there we go to the idea of the uh, cradle of this civilization being um, uh, Greece of the classic um, uh, period. So there is a kind of profusion of cliches and uh, kind of received images, so after images of ideas that sort of mat materializes in this um, Parthenon, so I'll try to maybe show you the the picture in a while. Right, so he, here is is the structure. So we decided to to give the project a working title, "Learning from Athens," and under this title, we we group um, several uh, parts that we thought were identifiable as constitutive parts of Documento 14, where uh, the public exhibition is, is the first one uh, since Documenta is expected to be an exhibition. Then we have various public programs, then we have publications that are kind of public already in their um, name. We have public education, which we called an education, but here we wanted to kind of level everything down and insist on the kind of public dimension in each of these um, parts of the process and of the project. We even had public radio and public television. Um, public radio was a, a sort of uh, transnational project of, that involved several radio stations in, in different countries in the world and also a series of specially commissioned um, sound projects for a uh, final uh, iteration of Documenta Radio, um, which went under the title coined by uh, Bonaventure So Beijing Ndikung, a Cameroonian uh, curator based in Berlin and initiator of uh, Savvy Contemporary, which is a pretty amazing um, institution in Berlin. Uh, so this radio uh, um, um, project had the title Every Time I Ear, ear the Sound, which is a line from Mutabaruka, a, 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 a reggae artist. And then public television, there was some, so to say, irony involved here to a degree. 
Um, public television w was a, a cycle of over 50 evenings on Greek national television called um, ERT. This television became at a certain point famous because uh, the previous, uh, during, during the um, time of Neo -de Neo Demokratia rule in Greece, the previous government, uh, there was a decision to um, take this television off the air, so the country had no national television at a certain point. The screen went black. Um, which, for instance, reminds me the moment in 1981 in Poland, um, the, intro, uh, the, the kind of moment of introduction of the martial law in Poland and the first sign that something has changed and we have a state of emergency was the fact that as an 11-year-old kid you put on TV in order to watch your cartoon on Sunday morning and there is nothing, it's just black. It's a pretty traumatizing moment to lo lose your television. So this television was somehow reactivated during the um, uh, next um, government, the Syriza government, and we negotiated the sort of use of the channel in late hours of every Monday, and we screened all kind of uh, content there from uh, Jonas Mekas to Tony Conrad to uh, documentaries from whichever p parts of the world that you normally don't don't find uh, on television. And this program was curated by Hila Pelek, a Berlin-based um, curator who is mainly involved with um, moving images and, and television, and Vasily Burikas, who is a, a very ingenious <coughs> um, experimental film programmer based in, in Athens. Voila. Um, right. So there are all these parts public, as you see, public uh, exhibition, public public um, programs, education, and so forth. And then there is this one little part which is not public. It's called Notes and Works. Um, but not entirely private. Notes and works ended up uh, as a pretty heterogeneous collection of interventions that were conceived mainly for the website. And they were motivated usually by what was happening in the process. So there was no specific brief for notes and works. This was just collecting um, material and also responding to certain circumstances, which could be, for instance, the um, death of an artist in in the process of making of the exhibition, which happened uh, several times, unfortunately. Um, here you have a short text, for instance, uh, in memory of Chiamonaleti Letogonolo Pinky Mayeng, who is uh, part of IKEA, an uh, all-female co collective of performers from South uh, Africa. Um, who uh, who died suddenly uh, at a very young age um, shortly after the collective presented their uh, performance in um, in Athens and she actually visited Athens together with other members of the collective and then she died untimely and um, so there is an obituary so there's a bunch of obituaries but there is also this distinction um, <coughs> seen here between the artists who are invited to participate in the exhibition and mostly commissioned to uh, make new works and historical artists such as Ivory Ox. Um, and so in the printed uh, publications, we don't have like a systematic um, introduction of all those historical artists, and there were many, many of them in Documenta, and we used the website, the Notes and Works section to um, go a little bit in depth uh, w uh, in regard to, to the work of, of all those historical figures. And, you know, some of them were present through works that were loaned from different p public or private collections, such as Ivory Axe. But for instance, Dimitris Picionis was mostly present through the work that exists in situ, 
So in this case, we, we sort of incorporated an amazing work, which is a system of footpaths um, that um, cross the Philopapu Hill, the Hill of Muses in Athens, and also the hills of Acropolis. So Picionis was in the late 50s commissioned to, uh, to create a, a kind of system of uh, paths, uh, access for, for people to these historic sites. And instead of proposing a kind of intervention and designing a new pattern of paths, he decided to follow what another artist in Documenta 14, um, David Harding, who is, I think, eight years old now, um, termed desire lines. So desire lines are paths that are made informally by people, just shortcuts, or it could be, you know, paths that shepherds follow, uh, that sh shepherds and animals they follow make. So Picion uh, before Picionis paved um, uh, f new footpaths, he very carefully observed the existing paths that were not paved, and he used some of them to create this unique horizontal, I think quite radical and early minimalist sculpture, um, which is which is sort of it is not only uh, just paving, but it's using all different kinds of stones, both parts of uh, I don't know ancient pottery found uh, on, on site, and also pieces of rubble from uh, the World War II, from houses demolished in Athens to make room for new real estate projects and so forth. So 54, 58, this system of put footpaths was created. So I'm, I'm just pondering uh, over this work a little bit for several reasons, because we wanted, through the fact that we kind of sent visitors to walk these paths simply because they were there, uh, we wanted not only to include Picionis as one of the important artists in Documenta, but to kind of insist on the on the very uh, pedestrian character of Documenta um, 14 exhibition. And this was on the Athenian side, Dimitris Picionis and his footpaths, and on the castle side, uh, it, there was a, a certain focus on on the teaching and uh, on the kind of educational. Uh, practice and research conducted also at the Academy of Fine Arts in Kassel by a very um, eccentric Swiss couple, um, Lucius and Annemarie Burkhardt, who were living in Kassel, I think, since the very late 60s uh, until the 1980s, and Lucius Burkhardt, who was an inventor of a new science called strolology or promenadology, was teaching uh, at uh, the the art school there, and he proposed a way of teaching in motion. So instead of keeping students in the lecture hall or or in a seminar room, he took them for uh, endless walks uh, in the city of Kassel and in its environs. So uh, that was like for us an uh, important um, practice of kind of embodied knowledge and also shared between those who participate in walks, both the Professor Burkhardt and, and his students. And um, so this, uh, these paths were, were rather important um, to, to kind of describe the exhibition as a, as a pretty much um, pedestrian uh, experience that needs some time to develop. Um, all right. Um, apart from individual entries dedicated to artists, we also have parts here like Studio 14. And this is, this is kind of important because Studio 14 is nowhere to be found in official papers of the Comenta, although it was a project uh, kind of on equal uh, level of importance to other components of the exhibition, but Studio 14 was initiated in order to uh, kind of uh, finally sort of de-essentialize uh, Documenta 14. So we thought it's interesting to create a kind of moving entity 
that is not going to include the name of Documenta, but just a number. And number is something quite ab abstract and doesn't really mean anything in particular. And number 14 certainly is not very symbolically charged, for instance, on the contrary to numbers such as 3 or 12. So st Studio 14 was just a studio, and it was, a, it was kind of located within the space of uh, music conservatory in Athens, but it also uh, realized certain actions such as seminars, discussions, interventions in other places in, in Athens and also in Kassel. And the important thing is that there was no brief for creation of Studio 14. I, I asked two um, befriended, let's say, curators, organizers, uh, from um, Rome, Salvatore La Canina, uh, oh, he's actually from Sicily but working in Rome, and Paolo Do to um, enter uh, a small alliance with a number of Athenian protagonists and to, to create something that will be going without information being delivered in the kind of main body of documenta messages, something like um, perhaps a a kind of free-floating or antibody uh, of Documenta, but also with possibility of like, extension beyond the duration of Documenta, because this was something that, that really concerned us a lot. We did not want to think of Documenta as sort of phenomenon limited in time. We thought it's, it's an experience, and experience should have different continuations. So I suppose Studio 14 is a kind of figurative way of embodying a possibility of such continuation. But other continuations are just in the working of those people who participated, hopefully. Um, this note and works started with uh, this one um, st statement that I'll try to, yes, uh, to make it simple. Here you have it isolated. There are two ways of seeing the ways of seeing the world. One is one way and the other is another. And nobody knows, is there anywhere one way of seeing the two? So th th this is a s sentence borrowed from a Polish um, a right writer um, who was, um, um, among other things, he realized um, two uh, important experimental films in the n early 1930s, uh, um, one is called Europe and the other one is Calling Mr. Smith. Uh, together with his wife, uh, Franciszka Temerson, they worked, um, they, they went to work in London and they uh, founded a publishing house called Jabber Bocus Press and uh, produced quite a lot of intellectual ferment in London. And um, Temerson is known for this kind of um, paradoxes and puns. And I thought this one was very fitting to open the discussion uh, about an exhibition that is trying to avoid you know, being located in one place or the other or being just merely composed out of two parts that follow each other. It's, it's, it's a little bit like uh, you know, discussing the nature of Holy Trinity, but this is a rather unholy duality um, in, involved in Documenta Athens, Documenta Castle, and this brought us uh, pretty far and actually resulted also in quite violent backlash against Documenta 14, um, motivated seemingly only through the economic concerns after the uh, news of, of the major deficit were um, published in the, end of, or in the beginning of, of September uh, this year. Um, okay, so that was the, p the part called notes and works, sorry. Okay. Beyond the menu. Okay. Um, I think it will be important to have some time for a discussion or a conversation. I was asked to to leave some time for for questions. I mean, I can 
keep talking about Documenta, but maybe it's also, uh, I, I, I will respond uh, generously to any question. So, and I think in this way we can, yeah, okay, um, before I give you the floor, I'm, I'm, I want to encourage you to, to visit Documenta um, in this form, especially that a couple of days ago, um, what happened to Earth Television in Athens some years ago, that it suddenly ceased to exist, happened also like in a nightmare, uh, like recurring cauchemar to this website suddenly it disappeared and we felt like we are we meaning you know those who were somehow involved like artists and others we felt we are kind of missing a, a limb so we, or we felt like uh, we are a phantom limb of something that you know exists somewhere but so apparently the reasons for the website being taken down was some kind of administrative issue uh, that had to do with some uh, rights to, to some images uh, that were not clear. And as a result, the whole website was, was taken down and we were trying to wrench it back um, for a couple of days. And um, it is on again. And I hope it's not going to, I hope it's there to stay, so to say. Uh, in its kind of digital longevity. Um, the picture you're looking at is a very striking portrait from 1934 by Abdurrahim Bouza, who was one of the few early Albanian modernists. And here you see this portrait um, freshly framed by the National Gallery of Art in Tirana, Albania, as a sort of inclusion, or I would rather say intrusion, in the otherwise extremely full and um, completely um, designed narration of an exhibition in a very special museum in Athens, which is called the Gika House. Uh, so the Gika House is a museum located in the former house and studio of a painter, uh, um, Gikas. And it's basically a history of uh, modern art or modernity, uh, rather, in Greece. So you have, uh, you know, memorabilia of writers and you have a lot of artworks and so forth. There is absolutely no space to, to insert another work. And we thought, uh, and there are a lot of works by, by uh, Nikos Hadzikiriakos Gika, uh, who used to live and work there and then donated the house to, to, to the state. Uh, so n now it is a part of a Benaki Museum, which is a major museum in Athens, sort of public-private. Um, we l loaned a um, small number of this early modernist works from 1930s from Albania because they were kind of from exactly the same period um, as most of the display um, in the Gika, Gika house. Uh, but this display addresses only uh, Greek artists so it's a, it's a it's a kind of limited national uh, kind of portrait of modernity in Greece in the making or un unfinished project of of modern Greece um, and so um, these paintings were uh, placed there as sort of exiles or perhaps intruders on a very different kind of display structure, so like a kind of freestanding um, metal frame painted white and held in place by, um, by sandbags of a kind that are used, for instance, to, uh, you know, during the flood, if you want to, to build a sort of small dam 
uh, during the flood you use like sandbags. Uh, so it, there is something temporary about the sandbags. They don't belong to exhibition space often, and they were just used as a weight to to hold this large um, metal um, display structure in place and the pretty uh, 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 small uh, paintings from National Gallery were sort of dot dotting the space of of the display dedicated to Greek art. And here we enter a kind of issue of, you know, what is the presence of of uh, Albania in the kind of perception um, of the public in Greece. And you have two things, like uh, first, um, historically, and the, the kind of uh, problematic historical relationship between Albania and Greece, and contemporarily where Albanians constitute the largest uh, minority in Greece, which g goes pretty um, unacknowledged. Uh, however, Albanians are considered to be very skillful uh, craftsmen or workers, So, yeah, and they are also uh, relatively um, cheap labor still in Greece, and they are willing to work, so they are present. But they are not present through through the kind of cultural manifestation in the sort of uh, national temple of high Greek art and mo modernity. So um, it's just like one tiny example of like many um, um, dissonances or, or like ways of uh, curating the, this exhibition in order to, to introduce uh, some ruptures or questions in otherwise uh, seemingly intact uh, narrations of art historical and especially of political kind. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, All right, thank you very much for the interesting uh, lecture. Now, I wanted to ask you uh, one question before I give the, the word to the audience. And um, this is um, quite uh, general, I hope you don't mind. And now, um, to Finnish audience, and maybe European audience, the most well-known art events, if you put it that way, are uh, Castle, of course, taking place not that often, and then Venice Biennial, and then Manifesto taking place in Sicily next summer. And um, so these are sort of the the Holy Trinity in Europe, if you say it that way. And then there's quite a few biennials and uh, triennials and whatsoever taking place in Asia and South America and so forth and so forth. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of curious about your opinion about the, the future of this machinery uh, after your experience of curating Documenta 14. What do you think? Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm not interested in, in future of the machinery. Um, I was interested in whether there would be any practical use that one could make of the received, uh, uh, as I said, dispositive or apparatus of such exhibition. The mega exhibition seems to be a very unhandy tool. You cannot shake it easily. So it's tremendous effort to change its course, um, its organizational uh, structure um, to, uh, to confront uh, the sort of decision making and also the uh, the kind of explicit decision making and the kind of implicit politics involved in in the kind of constitution of such phenomenon like uh, a great uh, or large international exhibition, um, I like to to uh, to use the acronym um, L I E LI large international exhibition, because there's something really tricky about those. And, you know, uh, Manifesta might be a, a, a wandering biennial. Still, it, it's a kind of biennial which shows a certain flexibility, and flexibility is one of the new gods that we are not going to pray to. So, um, 
I think we were trying to be very uh, uh, un un inflexible, unfle not very not flexible in in the way of of con confronting the kind of fundamental parameters of something like Documenta. So, so the fact that the city of Kassel was called Documenta Stadt for me was a good reason to ask whether one can really own something for for good or whether our illusions of belonging, of having roots, of, of having something in our hands that we can uh, claim to own are but illusions. And, you know, this project was, was born out of such considerations. And um, um, uh, historically and politically, um, the biennial and documenta are of very different making. Biennial the Venice Biennial is a kind of extension of um, of the phenomenon of the 19th century, you know, major kind of trade exhibitions. Uh, this is the part of what uh, Tony Bennett called exhibitionary complex that first produced exhibitions of trades and innovations in industry and such, like the famous one that took place, uh, you know, for which the Crystal Palace in London was built. So, So this is a kind of... Uh, the, there's also an interesting book by Neil Cummings and Marisha Lewandowska, uh, which is kind of tracing the twofold genealogy of the museum in the shopping, uh, early shopping mall, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, the collections of the cabinet d'amateur, or, or the you know collections of curia or private collections. On the one hand, on the other hand, the kind of regimes of display of such places like shopping most in the 19th century. So, so the Venice Biennial founded uh, as it was in the very end of 19th century is inheriting this baggage of, uh, of exhibitions of that kind. While Documenta is, is, is one of a kind because Documenta is, is conceived on the one hand as a kind of you know, humanist cry and an intervention of someone with very specific biography, Arnold Bode, uh, the founding uh, father or one of the um, uh, figures be behind this uh, first document in 1955. It, it, it comes as a kind of compensation for a loss of, uh, you know, avant-garde and, and kind of uh, uh, contemporary art of that time in Germany following the uh, takeover of power by the Nazis and, you know, the, the, the change, uh, what, what was the most advanced art of the time suddenly became the degenerate art. And Bode himself was an artist, he, or, he was also exhibition organizer already in the late 20s and early 30s in Kassel. He co-organized several exhibitions of um, the so-called Kassel Secession because there were this exhibitions of different secessions as a form of showing new artistic production in the 20s and 30s in Germany and other um, um, mostly German-speaking countries. Uh, so Bode had experience as exhibition maker and he was an artist who lost everything, his entire production when his studio was, uh, when he was kind of banned from his studio by the Nazis. So he was personally, you know, affected uh, and then he was sent to, uh, as a, a you know, as a, as a soldier of Wehrmacht to, uh, to, uh, to the front in, in in France, and he spent his time in German army, uh, you know, with a sketchbook, um, making drawings of Bois de Boulogne, but also of trenches and bunkers of Maginot Line and and so forth. So, so okay, so so there's a certain a certain biography or a certain consequence in. In, in Arnold Bodes dealing with how to kind of, in a major way, restart, uh, you know, go all the way back to, to the moment before 1933 and to kind of bring contemporary art back to, I into the, the, the sort of uh, circuit of, of the German society. And this is, this is something, you know, this is a kind of exhibition as a, as a civilizational project in Germany in the 1950s against the backdrop of a Marshall Plan B, the kind of diplomacy of Germany, which at that time uh, seeks for um, 
new recognition of Germany on the kind of European arena and not coincidentally uh, the first president of, of, of the Federal Republic, Theodor Heuss, uh, who, was a, who was a kind of honorary patron of the first documenta in 1955 and opened it in 1955. And since that time, uh, each documenta is opened by the German uh, uh, president. So that same Theodor Heuss uh, did his first international official journey in 1956, and it was a journey to Athens, to Greece. And the location was pretty well chosen because it's this pilgrimage to the place of the roots of European civilization, Greek democracy, and so forth. And this is, this is what politicians of all kinds are performing until now. We have seen you know, Barack Obama shortly before he uh, stopped being American president, sort of walking ar around Acropolis and on the cover of the magazine called Blue, produced by Aegean Airlines. And recently we have seen Emmanuel Macron also appearing, you know, with Acropolis as a, as a backdrop. So, so this, is, this is a kind of uh, beginning of documenta in the kind of civilizing uh, uh, project. For Manifesta, I, I, I think that there are other factors at play and I don't really see necessarily all biennials in the same way. You know, a biennial may play a very important role for for a place, uh, I suppose uh, many would agree that, the, for instance, the biennial in Dakar is, is, is a rather significant event for many producers um, and the public in, in this part of the world, while some other biennials seem to be less important. They rather serve uh, purposes of, of city marketing of a kind. And we try to take the original uh, premise of documenta quite seriously and not not allow it to be reduced to a brand and to to a kind of you know a, a powerful tool uh, bringing a rapid injection of money every five years into the economy of Kassel and Hessia only right interesting now uh, there's a question thanks for the team yeah we're going to open up now for questions for the audience and uh, there's two microphones being carried around so please and because the, there's quite a few of you so uh, please rick up your hand like bang if you want to ask okay this yeah uh, thank you um, um, i'm kim Zari, a, a writer and artist so I, I saw a documenta in Kassel, not in Athens, so I, that is my knowledge about documenta, the four, 14. Um, uh, the uh, Greek uh, spirit and the Greek uh, accent was really strong also in, in, in Kassel. Mm. And um, <clears throat> you have already told uh, about the, the motivation of this uh, this uh, aspect, and it's very easy to understand it uh, politically and historically. Uh, but uh, what about artistically? Uh, thinking about uh, contemporary art, uh, I, I would be very curious to uh, uh, to hear if you if you tell a little, little bit more about this uh, uh, Greek theme in in in, in documenta. And uh, my, I also would like to ask. Are you happy with the result? Did you did what you wanted? Um, yeah, I, I I must admit that I did what I what I wanted to do. Whether I'm happy, that's that's beyond the point. Uh, I must also admit that it was not necessarily done in order to make me or someone happy. It was in order to. Uh, to maybe uh, get some um, understanding of things or like create conditions for understanding and for asking questions. So uh, these conditions were by large created, therefore I, I probably should be happy. As for the Greek uh, themed documenta, yes, Greece is a strong marker. Um, as said before, the introduction of the of the Parthenon and you know that basically occupied an entire Friedrichsplatz, which is you know the site of Documenta from from the very beginning, was 
a strong move, equally strong move was the the sort of um, hosting the c collection of the <coughs> National Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens in the Fridericianum. You may remember that in Documenta 13, Fridericianum was organized around the central part, th which is a rotunda of Fridericianum, which uh, went by name uh, of the brain. Um, so in Documenta 13, the brain was located in the Fridericianum um, as a kind of um, exhibition within the exhibition that sort of represents that, as I understood, like different lines in thinking of the curator uh, of Documenta 13, Caroline Christel Bakerjiev. And um, we propose instead a kind of uh, a decapitation uh, of, of Documenta, in a way, a kind of acephalic strategy, um, erasure of the symbolic center, a disbelief in the once and for good given symbolic charge of certain holy sites, such as Fridericiano, we try to uh, go back to the original uh, function of Fridericiano, which was a public museum. It was built as a, as a museum with some limited public access, but still with public access. Uh, in Athens, the paradox of, 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 of the crisis is such that uh, um, museum that was built or rather converted from an in industrial building in the center of Athens already more than 10 years ago cannot open because of the economic crisis and probably will not be able to fully open and we wanted to work with this situation. So on the one hand we wanted to show a possibility you know how would it feel to have actually a museum of contemporary art in the very center of Athens uh, with exhibitions on all floors and you know programs and all that and for that reason we um, negotiated through many months of discussion with the director and curators of, of, of the museum a, a kind of idea of, of exchange in which the collection, the permanent collection or would be permanent collection of of the National Museum of Contemporary Art is shown in the center of Documenta Castle, while the, docu the international exhibition of Documenta 14 has uh, the premises of the National Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens as one of its important venues. So um, I think the discussion of artistic merits of, um, of an exhibition is endlessly complex and I would not um, by default uh, you know call this or that part of exhibition like artistically or, you know important or successful I think there were good and bad works all over the show and uh, among them were Greek works uh, by Gr works by Greek artists there was a certain over-representation of Greek artists in the exhibition through the fact that the collection of EMST, of the Museum of Contemporary Art, is primarily dedicated to Greek contemporary art, although with important international um, uh, artworks too. So, it, for me, it was a little bit like installing a ready-made uh, in the exhibition, so that part of the show was completely beyond uh, so we kind of renounced the curatorial uh, authority over over this part, and the exhibition in Fridericiano was realized according to the so-called museological concept that was formulated by the director and curators of the EMST in anticipation of future opening um, of EMST, the National Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens, to the to the public. So it was like a kind of a test run of an idea. And I think it was important to to do this test run in order also to see, you know, to which extent this concept of uh, uh, permanent collection, which, uh, in my opinion, is fairly static uh, as a as a concept, you know, can work with a type of audience, for instance, visiting like international art exhibition, you know, which doesn't mean that this collection is shown 
in the museum in Athens would have exactly the same Wirkung, um, uh, im, im, impact, I don't like the, yeah. Um, I don't like the word impact, but Wirkung is something that has to do with, you know, the way things work. Uh, could be very different if the same works were shown in the building of the museum in Athens, but whether this is going to happen, we don't know. But we, we, we posed a big question mark, you know, it was also meant as a signal to, to maybe both governments, Greek and German, to think seriously you know, about the city in Europe called Athens, the cradle of civilization, which has a huge building, fully functional museum of contemporary art, which remains closed. You know, and this is, of course, one, one of many closed buildings in Athens and one of many institutions that collapsed or nearly collapsed or didn't open. But we are working in, uh, let's say, cultural field, roughly speaking, so we can demonstrate these conditions with cultural institutions and, and not, for instance, with uh, you know, some, some other institution that, that we think could work but doesn't. No. Okay, we had a question somewhere up there. Hi. Oh. Um, <clears throat> I think I have a two-part question, or at least two questions. The, the first was about, um, you mentioned that the public uh, brings a certain kind of knowledge to the um, biennial, including the children and the elderly and everyone else. I'm wondering if you can share any examples of how that manifested or um, and the other one, I'm trying to ask a question that's kind of related through the uh, Thamerson quote, and that is um, the biennial is very much about the public, and it's also very much about the uh, the institution and its history. And I'm wondering if, um, like. Emerson asks, is it possible to experience both of those things at the same time, or in one place? Do those make sense? So, uh, <clears throat> maybe the second part of the question, if it's possible to experience them in one place? Yes. Y yes. I think it's possible to experience, this in, experience it in any way. I think we were aiming at something that would not be, um, you know, like uh, ob ob obligatory um, or like compulsory, you know, program that you you have it only when you visited this, 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 and this. You, you don't have you know, uh, a visitor arriving. For instance, if I'm an, a visitor to Documenta. I'm supposedly professional, but I'm usually drowning. I, I can't stand it. Okay, I, I arrived in Kassel and there's like millions of things happening. I'm missing five things. You know, I'm not one of these guys who work with a kind of um, agenda on some kind of uh, device and, and, and just like jetting from point A, B, C, D and so forth. I appreciate a possibility of time and also even of wasting time. Exhibitions in my opinion, are privileged places where we can afford time. And uh, the appeal to the audience to feel uh, owners of the exhibition was more, um, it, it was not so much to, to create for them in a sort of patronizing way, specific forms and points of access, because we know how to do these things. And there are people who know it better than I. If, if those people were in charge, they would have done a different exhibition. I was interested in the kind of obs obscurity uh, of the experience in the moments of uh, undefined and partly private encounters. And I was interested in visitors counted in thousands and you know reaching the kind of mythical million or something like that as individuals. Uh, it, trying to imagine I individual experience of a, a person, it can be you know, it's, it's, it's not like one person, it's many different persons. It can be 
a person bring his or her own uh, luggage, uh, experience, knowledge, uh, origins, history, and so forth. I each of these people sees documenta or anything, uh, an artwork, in a very different way. The education is working in order to create a kind of uh, average or, let's say, a, a kind of um, a, a kind of Im image of an exhibition n next to an exhibition. Now, I'm more interested in the kind of experiential character um, of um, such encounter w with a work of art, because I believe that this is the moment in which art can have a kind of transformative um, power. Uh, and and it, it will not happen if we are only discussing, you know, age groups, um, uh, crafting or tailoring an offer to, you know, to, to professionals and to non-professionals and so forth. I'm, I'm, you know, this, this kind of management of, of, of the population doesn't interest me, or rather I'm, I'm vividly interested in, in kind of all kinds of disruptions to, to, to those forms of management. So, for instance, the uneducation, the, the sort of educational program of Documenta was, um, in my opinion, it was, it was not something that was supposed to bring like instant great practical achievement that you know everybody is suddenly de-schooled and decolonized in, like but it was a way to tell these people from education that their task is to question their metier and to engage you know in a kind of build up of of the awareness within that department and reaching beyond the department that, that, that we are dealing with very tricky tools and this whole business of education and art education is something that will on long term need radical reformation, uh, reformulation like, like many things you know, in and around the exhibition business as usual. So, so um, yeah. Okay, um, any more questions? There's one up there, two up there. Um, it's interesting, just like your last point, um, because it touches on my question. It's nothing to do with Documenta. My question was over, um, I've been reading a lot about the increased professionalization of the arts industry, um, particularly in relation to curation, um, and the, I guess, the unprecedented amount of um, curatorial studies and arts management um, courses available in mm -hmm. various institutions, and if you had anything to say about that. Uh, you want me to comment on this professionalization of which I'm an early product? <laughs> Prototype. Early. Yeah. <laughs> Failed. Uh, okay. Um, I think I, uh, I, I did say it before that, that I'm, I'm very... To say that I'm skeptical uh, yeah, I mean, one, everybody can have an opinion, but I, <laughs> but, but I think it, it is it is important to 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 question this metier, especially that it's new and nobody has a monopoly on saying you know what kind of animal it is, the curator. So so we we should be able to 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 use this role. Maybe 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 it's the keeper of the keys. You know, maybe it's somebody who, who who has keys and you know should open the house and let people in. You know, this is w one possible way of doing this. This is, for instance, the lesson of of the um, Berlin Biennial curated by Artur Zmijewski some time ago. Although, you know, he opened the house and he let people in, and then the whole art world sort of uh, bashed him in, like on the spot. You know, he was like wiped out, like bad boy. So. Um, and there are there are more sophisticated and and more uh, accomplished examples of such anti-curatorial practices that I think are all worth endorsing because otherwise we are going to to be moving in a kind of uh, loop of of reproduction of certain patterns of exhibition making which are really not necessary apart from you know the fact that it of course does give jobs to to a number of people but you know. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, professionalization might at certain point mean that, you know, those who are like n not attending these courses are kind of like lesser curators or something. Um, the hi history of the profession is such that these people who this the people who organized exhibitions were either artists or they were like dilettanti coming from other fields. For instance, Bonaventure Ndikung, my colleague, um, <coughs> in, in Documenta 14, curator at large, he, he used to be, a, like some years before, he was a biochemist and then he had an illumination and from biochemistry he, he changed to curating. How does this happen? I don't know. I have, I have no idea and that's good so. Um, you know, Quinn Latimer, who served as a editor in chief of all publications of Documenta and who brought like major input to the South magazine and, you know, almost single handedly organized the content of, of kind of textual production for Documenta, you know, she, she's a poet. Um, she, she's not, uh, let's say, she, she made herself a professional editor among other things but uh, I, yeah i don't i think I, I think it's it's more interesting to to look at people's capacities than uh, at, at what you know wh wh where they coming from from which kind of professional uh, box all right there's questions on the left yeah. since a long there. time uh, sorry i had a question to hear <laughs> ah yeah, yes. I see. Do you want to go left? <laughs> no. Okay. I had enough of it. I go center. Okay. Is that one of the lessons from Greece? Because, okay, let's start. Um, you talked a, a lot about decolonization and decolonizing practices. You also talked about the theater and its double which is Arto, taking Eastern concepts and kind of putting them into Western um, context. And then you also said something about um, uh, difference and repetition when you were talking about Athens and Castle. So my question is, Ah, also, sorry, <laughs> another one. <laughs> um, you also said you wanted to create, not create a, a parallel to the exhibition, but have the people experience themselves. So I'm wondering how could first document uh, be a decolonizing practice if it's German and it goes to Greece, and also like. Um, if it's the parallel, like a, a parallel text presenting Athens to um, the civilized world of artists and art entrepreneurs and uh, all the people visiting Athens for documenta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, as I as I under, you know, the difficulty of. Uh, of organizing of an idea, the difficulty with an idea of of having documenta born in Germany, although you know institutions are not born, they are made and le legally organized in specific way. Uh, so uh, it was a little bit to uh, also create a kind of demonstration, of, you know, because of course there is a kind of vaguely. Uh, colonial intention every visit or incur it can be seen as a kind of incursion or violation or, or whatever. On the other hand, one could say that um, probably what, what one would not disagree uh, with the idea that an encounter can be productive. So w I'm, I'm, I don't believe that a country, a kind of national uh, entity has a monopoly on its own history and the whole knowledge is there and only there and won't come out. In Greece, we were confronted with very violent reactions each time we were trying to say something, you know, about uh, Greek history or, or, or Greek culture or Greek politics of today. 
we were immediately accused from all sides of the spectrum, you know, by the extreme right for putting a marble refugee tent on the Filopapu Hill, which is a holy site, um, apparently one of the many holy sites uh, of Greek civilization. And, you know, here an artist from kind of Aboriginal background is bringing a marble tent, which is a copy of those tents that are uh, uh, pitched on, on the harbor of Piraeus, where the arriving refugees are temporarily camping. Um, on the other hand, the left hated us for the fact that we stole their agenda instantly, and not only stole it, but dig into it, uh, deconstructed it, and, and showed a certain, um, let's say, anachronism of, of hardcore left positions organized uh, you know, in the spectrum from the neo-Stalinist KKE to, to anarchists of all breeds. So I just, I don't think that, uh, you know, I, 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 I do not grant a monopoly on, on kind of uh, make, making politics to, to, to one tribe or to, you know, tribes only. I'm, I'm, I'm against this kind of, uh, uh, you know, tribalization of knowledge and, and this kind of um, holding to, to, to the idea of like being the exclusive owner of some knowledge, some politics and so forth. I think, I think that this was a, uh, a kind of proposal for more like transversal reading of different, let's say, progressive, if you like, politics and alliances that c could be possible. And Besides, uh, I think that exhibition and, and art has to be seen not um, as something that has similar consequences as, for instance, the decisions of, of politicians, but it's an artifice, it's a demonstration, it's a, it's a play, okay? Yeah, but I was accused before I opened my mouth. I was accused that I want to teach and not learn, that I want to colonize, that I want to, you know, the document I want to, the document is German, I'm Polish. Uh, you know, before I opened my mouth, I was, you know, I was confronted with an avalanche of stereotypes, you know, r repressed, uh, deeply buried complexes a uh, lot of hate and all that stuff, you know, and so that was the Pandora's box and that was our purpose. We, we wanted to make these discourses, you know, visible publicly because in the future I very much hope that these discourses will not be saved from internal critique, you know. So, I did not complain, I don't feel victimized, I described mechanisms. I, I, I think this is a very lit literal interpretation, you know, I can describe what happened. As long as I can describe, I can take distance to, to what happened. I, I, I don't think that, you know, I, I did not uh, expect a warm embrace or anything like that neither in Germany nor in Greece, so, and I was right, so. Okay, we had a, uh, somebody there asking a question. <laughs> yeah, right there. Um, what is the legacy of Documenta 14 in Athens, in your opinion? I, I have no idea, you would have to, to ask people there. In your, uh, but if you would like, from your perspective, like what do Look, you... Look, I, I was working on this show, on, on this project, uh, and, you know, living in Athens, t talking to hundreds of people, and, you know, and these people were not uh, the, the artwork people or, or you know, uh, 
r rich American tourists from from Varoufakis's uh, you know fable about Documenta. But there were like all kinds of people, people running institutions, people setting up grassroots organizations, people I would not speak about because their names should not be mentioned and so forth. Um, my uh, comrades in Documenta 14 were doing exactly the same. I think we affected in many different ways loads and loads of people. Many of these people will probably keep asking themselves questions or maybe their way of thinking will get inflected, maybe only slightly, but somehow inflected by the fact that we were there. And I, I, I cannot t tell what exactly, you know, I, I think the legacy is something so uh, stale and, and essential that I cannot imagine, you know, I, I can speak about, le uh, you know, individual legacies and certain projects that are still, you know, going on. And if we manage to, for instance, you know, um, bring one or the other institution into shape through some efforts um, that are occasioned by Documenta but that continue after Documenta that I think would be uh, some kind of win also for, for the users, for, for people in Athens. Otherwise, I think it was, it was a, a, an experience of opening up discourses that mobilized large numbers of participants and made them formulate sometimes super critical and sometimes, you know, ecstatically affirmative uh, uh, judgments, analysis and so forth, you, you know. There are, uh, there are seminars and there are uh, projects that, that basically immediately took Documenta as a, as a sort of uh, field on which to kind of operate. Um, as a kind of strange phenomenon that needs to be analyzed, explained, and so forth. So I guess it, it did have uh, some um, lasting effect. And what kind of effect? I cannot tell. I d I'm not sure. <coughs> yes. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a small comment and a question. Yeah. Uh, the comment is about, first I would like to thank you about your speech. I thought uh, I was actually counting the words uh, when the word, uh, word uh, decolonization will appear. And I have to say to the previous uh, person that it appears only once, and yes. it was in a comment at the end. And I have to say that um, it doesn't mean that you didn't use terminologies and also ideas and thoughts and doings that comes originate from the South, but this is the idea of the whole context of the exhibition. Oh, the Biennale. And um, maybe my, my small comment is, um, I think in a post-multi-county um, state, um, decolonization has been like, colonized by Western academia at the moment. You have courses about decolonization and decoloniality, and it's kind of the center of the talk. Less about the making, but more about talking about it. And I'm happy to see that you did something in relation to it and didn't stop only at just discussing it. Um, and maybe I have to say that decolonization, according to Fanon, is a disorder. It's a moment of disorder. And Documenta was not about a moment of disorder. It was what South American uh, thought thinkers say, talks about is um, decol decoloniality, which is thinking differently in relation to modernity. Mm. And I think you sk thinking and making things differently. And they use the term delinking, and I, I think you, you you succeeded in it. And of course, it generates a lot of antagonism and yeah. invested. There's invest, an invested emotional antagonism toward it. This yeah. is my comment. Now my question. Yeah. You talked about um, about the selection of the works mm. and also the placement of them and the experience. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that drew my mind during my uh, visit to the Comenta in Castle is the way of exhibiting. And it, it, I was a person who works with a lot of, uh, I mean, from, let's say, from the margins, um, in uh, precarious uh, institutions. Uh, I realized that most of the ways you exhibited, I mean, the documenta exhibited the works were somehow built in a really, um, uh, let's call it, um, um, how do you call it, like an underground 
what kind is it? <laughs> I mean, uh, vitrines, uh, lights, uh, everything looked as if it's uh, from a precarious, uh, you know, low budget um, um, Thank you. institution. I mean, this is German taxpayers. And, and I had to really look at the lights and examine all these vitrines and how they were built and the, the, the lights inside the vitrines and everything seems as, as if I'm, I'm, I'm working with my own, you know, things. Was this something you intended, or was it? I mean, the Comenta has this tradition. The first Comenta was about about uh, demo, demolished uh, places, uh, being in demolished places, like uh, concrete, um, like concrete yeah, buildings, yeah, but, etc. Okay. But yeah, okay, right, right. yeah, but that's my yeah, question. Okay, the first Comenta was like uh, you know high modernism at its best applied to a ruin. So, Bode was a designer. He was a you know product like a kind of d designer and he he designed this re redesigned the, the ruins you know establishing a kind of paradigm that then Burgel and Ruth Noack uh, you know refined in their documenta 12 for instance but uh, there was no intention of, of of a kind of shabby chic in uh, in documenta we did not try to be underground or anything like that um, um, we tried to create agreeable conditions for visitors to look at works. We had several spaces that were, you, you know, uh, high-profile museums, and we showed works loaned from foremost international collections that needed specific temperature and so forth. We fulfilled conditions. Uh, we had a number of other spaces that were falling into a different typology. That is, the, for instance, the space of uh, the so-called glass pavilions on Kurt Schumacher Strasse, where you are Nango, uh, um, Vivian Suter, uh, Georgia Sagri, and, and others showed the works. You know, th th this for me was not so much a natural gesture of like, let's grab some post-commercial ret like retail spaces and let's have fun making a show there. For me, it's a typology. I cannot, you know. The decision which space to choose to to organize a show, f f I cannot look at it without a kind of meta level and kind of uh, understanding implications of such use. And I think the key in a large exhibition like that is to to, to show a whole diversity of spaces: the purpose-built museums, uh, the the, the s small awkward museums. Uh, you know the the the, the iconic post-industrial or kind of post-production building of the post logistics center. You know the the, the failed retail of Kurt Schumacher Strasse spaces. So I think each each space and in Athens it's the same. You know each of the spaces plays a specific role in kind of demonstrating the possibilities and kind of t techniques of of this whole exhibition business with regard to how it kind of tries to naturalize spaces that it uses, and we try to denaturalize it and to yet create agreeable condition for presentation of artworks and for, for visitors to, to, uh, to, to, to see or hear or whatever um, those artworks. As a as a proxy, well, I see Athens as a proxy of, of structural adjustment programs that have been prevalent over the past three, four decades in the South that has crippled many countries, that has left them in debt traps. Um, what did Athens, as a proxy for that reality that's come to the shores of mm. Europe, taught Germany? Um. I, I think that that uh, the project, uh, the, the entire project, and also the outcome of the project, showed that uh, solidarity must come uh, with a certain price. Price. So, so solidarity is not something that can be just granted. You know, we. Um, it, it is something that, when granted, it it may actually fire back on you. And you'll be, uh, you'll have to, to, to meet, you know, the kind of real economy of of the situation, and maybe be generous and uh, able to give and able to share this kind of stuff. And I think, you know, we could talk about it a lot prior to the exhibition and kind of like build a narration. 
but uh, the fact that there is a deficit and that the politicians, uh, the stakeholders, are telling us that this deficit was exclusively generated in Athens, you know, th this is a significant lesson for me, and 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 it's it's the kind of narration that that doesn't make sense. You know, maybe it makes sense for a bookkeeper who can allocate certain costs according to predetermined uh, finance plan, finan financial plan, and demonstrate that you know this but money, the debt, is produced over there in the south, in Athens. If you read, for instance, how Neue Zürcher Zeitung, the, the you know, li leading and very trustworthy Swiss newspaper, reported on, uh, on the deficit of Documenta in the very beginning, you, you re read all the stereotypes that, you know, you know, probably the bribes were in place, you know, probably something happened there. It was not quite, you know, transparent and, and mm. uh, accountable. And this is just not true. The exhibition was done exactly in the same way, uh, you know, with the same degree of of control, when possible, with regard to spending money and so forth. We just, you know, tried honestly to to make it work in both places. There were no double standards applied, and uh, the the fact that uh, the exhibition grew sort of out of its. Uh, Usual, uh, you know, it, it it kind of changed paradigm w while you know we were making it. This, of course, had to come with its price. Th this is why I was uh, referring to probably the you know the 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 price of solidarity is something that one one needs to uh, take into account when making gestures of solidarity. Oh, you know, which are like very nice to show solidarity, but. To really do it, you, you you have to go all the way, um, you know, w within uh, the field that you're you're working in. That's how I would. Right here comes the last question, and I have the power to make it because I own the both. <laughs> right, but because we've been discussing quite a while now, and it's it's been really interesting. What but we have to wrap this up. And um, I wanted to ask you a, uh, not an intimate, but maybe somehow personal question. Now, you flew from Athens Atem to Helsinki yesterday. Yeah? And as I understood, you live in Athens and, and so forth. So there's sort of a uh, combine or a um, thread between you and the city. And then on the other hand, you have had a five-year project like Documenta Works. What's going to happen now? What's your next step? <laughs> I don't. I don't. No, I don't have an like professional step. It's up to you how you answer. <laughs> I, I don't know. I really don't don't have a, a evacuation plan. <laughs> uh, I was warned before I started to work on Document that this changes your life in a way that is not. Uh, how you say in yeah you can you cannot there is no return you know um, and I don't know um, for a moment I live in Athens and in a couple of months I might be moving away from Athens because I think I I did do this job and as long as there is no other uh, you know. Um, situations where I can engage uh, in Athens, like kind of seriously, then I would be rather, you know, trying to to have a life uh, elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Not trying to introduce into your life, but I, I, it's just like contemporary art is so periodical that we're all dealing with this uh, sort of uh, how would I say one year of this, two years of that, or four years of, of something else, and so on. That's the style of life. So that's why my question sort of burst out. All right, but we're finishing now, and, and thank you for coming. Uh, it was a lovely evening, and there were many of you, and it was a good discussion. Good night.